raise a glass to the past And the ladies cross the ages Fallen fathers from the motherland Whose lives are on the pages And the bottle said it best When he told us all the world's a stage So fellas, grab a glass And lift your spirits to the seventh age Welcome, one and all, to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. It's time to pour up a glass and pull up a chair as we gather together here in our favorite corner of the Cross Time Pub, digging and occasionally diving where necessary into history and looking for answers about our past. Joining me, as always, are my cohorts and comrades, Mr. James Waldo, team geologist, and the guy who is a great archaeologist without actually being an archaeologist, Mr. Jason Pentrail. How are you fellas doing? Doing great. It looks like my world of titles has now expanded. That's right. Well, you know, I was talking with somebody on the telephone the other day, and uh, I had said to him, I would put Jason with his knowledge of lithics up against most, at very least, grad student level archaeologists that I've met. And I think that some of our friends in the archaeological community would agree. Uh, I'll never forget Dr. Albert Goodyear talking with you. And as you were showing him a redstone point, he had said, wow, you really know a lot about this. And, you know, coming from somebody like Dr. Al Goodyear, that's a compliment. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I appreciate it, and I always try to stay humble with that. Um, you know, constantly learning. I learn something new every day, every week. Uh, I just stay in the books, keep reading, researching. And, uh, you know, flint napping helps with all that. So when you understand the stone, you understand how it works, and you actually do it yourself, put your hands on it. And uh, every stone has its own type, its own mystery. But the more you play with it, the more you work with it, the more it makes sense to you when you're looking at actual artifacts. Yeah. And our friends in archaeology are equally impressed by James Waldo's prowess as the brewmaster in chief here at the Cross Time Pub. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I'll give you the update on the on the latest uh, beer batch. I was afraid it was going to not come out very well, but it actually did. It's not the best beer that I ever made, but it it uh, it's it's quite tasty. Now, the, the the update to the update, though, is uh, I haven't had any this weekend because apparently there was a, a leak somewhere in my CO2 system and the tank, the CO2 tank went dry. So mm-hmm. now uh, it, it takes about it takes a week or so to kind of for the carbonation to get worked in. So I had the pressure up a little higher and now I have no pressure. So and it'll be Monday before I can get the tank refilled. Usually no pressure is a good thing, though, right? Yeah. Yeah. No pressure is usually desirable unless you have beer. Yeah, well, I have a brewing update as well. Now, Jason, mm-hmm. last time you well, actually time before last when you were here in town, I took you over to Sierra Nevada and showed you their uh, Willy Wonka esque facility, which is quite impressive. Mm-hmm. Now, indeed, there's another location which is even nearer to my house that I haven't taken you, and that is Highland Brewing, which is actually one of the oldest breweries uh, in terms of you know the real micro brewing culture that's become a big part of Asheville. It was really kind of they they advertised themselves, in fact, as Asheville's first micro brewery. And I went to their brewing room yesterday, up to their facility, which is in the same building as the old Blue Ridge Motion Pictures building, which I went up and toured years ago. And in fact, there's a big water tower that still has the Blue Ridge Motion Pictures emblem on it. But I went into the tasting room there at Highland, and I was going to order one of their famous black mocha stouts when I saw all of a sudden a dry Irish stout over here. This isn't available in stores. It's only available right there at their brewery. And I said, hold on, my man, is it too late for me to switch? And he says, no, no. So he says, you want to try our version of Guinness? And so he pours one of these, and I have to say it tastes nothing like Guinness, but it is an extraordinarily good dry Irish stout that they're making, which is available only there in their tasting room. So next time you guys are in mm-hmm. town, I know exactly where I'm going to take you. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm a big fan of Highland. You know, I, I have, oh, I don't know. See, I had some of their beers just uh, about two weeks ago. So, I mean, they're... Mm-hmm. They're, uh, you know, well-known, well-established, and they make a lot of good stuff. So, Yeah, they absolutely do. You know, when George Howard's in town, I need to take him up there for a beer, too. And we heard from old George the other day, our good pal. Uh, he had been here in Asheville, was it last fall, I think? He was up here for a meeting, and he and I actually did get to get together and have a beer together, and uh, dinner, in fact, and we talked for hours. And George is just one of my favorite people. And he actually uh, sent us an email, and something I really love about George is he will tell you exactly what he's thinking. And I always appreciate people who will share their views on things, even if they disagree, but they can always maintain a respectful dialogue. I think that huh, it's a bit of a problem in archaeology these days, and really in almost any discipline, that you see a lot of tribalism and a lot of people fighting each other. It's been apparent 
particularly in archaeology recently. And in the coming weeks, I think we'll probably address that more on future editions of this program. But again, it's all the more important, I think, that we're able to express ideas, share opinions, sometimes disagree, but do so respectfully. And that's something I always have enjoyed about George. And he wrote to us. I want to share his email here. He said, hey, guys, loving the show as always. And thank you for bringing attention to these obscure but profound subjects. All right. Today, however, to express my lingering disappointment with regard to your interview of our mutual friend, Chris Cottrell, uh, who is not only a good friend of the program, but also our buddy who joined us down at White Pond this year. And in fact, we actually roomed together. Uh, Brothers for life, right? But uh, he said, I was shocked that you managed to escape the interview without a single substantive question regarding his research on the formation of Carolina Bays. LIDAR is kind of interesting. Chris's teaching approach is admirable. And glad he drove and brought, uh, bought beer. But for gosh sakes, I wish you had given him a few openings and questions to directly educate your listeners on the Carolina Bay topic. Some questions I was looking for. What is the history of Carolina Bay research? Why do you believe that they are not 50,000 plus identical ancient lakes? Uh, tell us about the recent history of the research. Tell us about Zamora's peer-reviewed paper and his theory that perfectly, uh, or the, the, his theory that the perfect conical sections can only be produced by secondary impacts. Maybe explain that Chris believes these are secondary impacts and not craters, as he had to point out himself. What do Chris believe uh, are the principal flaws in our terrestrial hypothesis? I'm pleased that you pointed out that no one in the interview is angry, but why would anyone be angry, Chris? I think such an approach would be far more interesting than a superficial discussion of how science works when people disagree. Why do they disagree on the subject? Perhaps explain why Seven Ages believes that they are simple lakes. What does Chris Moore say about bays and why? Now, as you know, I've sold my... These are all really good questions, too, by the way. And in fact, actually, in a future conversation, maybe with Chris and uh, Chris. <laughs> there it goes again. We've got so many friends named Chris in, in this field of research. You know, can't escape it. But again, this this is real good fodder for a future conversation. And, and George asks some great questions. And he says, as, as you know, I've sold my soul and chosen to tread carefully on the Carolina Bays as a YDB, that's Younger Dryas Boundary, co-author and team member. The kooky caboose and all that. As well documented by Hancock in Chapter 17, and that in reference to Graham Hancock's new book, America Before, it can cause personal discord. And I don't want to stir it up, that painful episode right now, but Chris is all in with nothing to lose and deserved a more substantive approach since you invited him in, presumably as the most prominent proponent of these alternative theories. Uh, the kind of interview you usually provide. So I felt you treated the subject lightly and with trepidation and in the crazy aunt in the attic kind of approach. Uh, another analogy of mine for the subject. So he said, I don't know what Chris thought, but I can guess that since he followed up on his channel and tried to add some meat to the bone, and he links to that, we'll put that in the show notes. He said, uh, with that off my chest, I just authorized a long overdue $20 recurring monthly donation to Seven Ages. Please keep at it. I love you guys. Kind regards, George A. Howard, our friend, and we love you too, George. And, you know, I think one thing that we probably wanted to address about that interview is the fact that it was one in a series of several that we did while we were there at White Pond. Um, ideally, we would have wanted to go deep with every one of the guests. Chris Moore actually also was on that interview with us. It was the first time he spoke publicly after the publication of a new uh, article that was talking about uh, evidence for the Younger Dryas Impact event, this time at Pila Uko, the Chilean site. And he, along with James Kennett and a lot of other people that we respect, were all co-authors on that paper. Um, it was the first time he spoke about it, but did we get in-depth with him about it? Not really. And again, the reason why is because it was a bunch of people over the course of several long hours there in the White Pond Lodge, and we wanted to be able to spend a little time with each person. There was no way we could go deep with each person about every subject. And so what I would say to George is, if you listen to any of those interviews that we did with Tarek or you know, with, with Chris Moore or anybody... Uh, they were all fairly quick and to the point we maybe touched on one or two subjects. We didn't have time to go in depth with everybody. Uh, our hope would be to have Chris Cottrell back on the program in the future, which of course we will, being the good friend that he is. And all of these people we'd like to talk with more in depth. But what I would say is that in the context of that program, being one of the first shows that we've done where we feature several interviews in a great big kind of a mishmash like that, uh, there's no way we could touch on all those Questions. So they're great questions. They are absolutely the kinds of things we need to talk with Chris and Chris and Chris and other guys named Chris and maybe even people not named Chris in the future when we have these uh, discussions. Uh, but fundamental to it, and one of the reasons I wanted to share uh, George's email here is because George will tell you what he's thinking. He offers fodder for future discussion and debate, which is so helpful in all this, and continues to show support. Uh, I think it's far more important 
in the context of what we all are trying to do and achieve to maintain friendships, engage each other with hard questions, get into debate and dialogue about these things, move the discussion forward and more importantly, move the science forward, but not allow our innate tribal tendencies as humans to get in the way of that. One more reason we love George and a lot of the people that we work with. And, and you know, as we did evidence in that interview, Chris Cottrell has different opinions about the Carolina Bay formations than we do. And that never, ever would get in the way of our friendships and our mutual goals that we want to move toward, which is understanding the geomorphology of features like that and what role they may play in broader mysteries we're all trying to understand. Guys? George, thanks for the email. And folks, um, that's how it's done. When you want to have a civil discourse among gentlemen or ladies, you uh, you write an email like that. And, you know, the good thing I think about, about the, the Carolina Bays and Chris's work is this – this subject is not decided. Uh, we really don't know what the you know formation processes are, but this is how science is done. People out there getting out there doing the work, collecting the information, and at some point the, the truth will become known. So, uh, George, again, thanks. Yeah, and you know, I just I I agree completely with what you guys are saying. And uh, again, in the context of the White Pond interviews, uh, like Micah mentioned, it was kind of quick fire. We had a bunch of interviews that were there, literally there all afternoon. Um, there was other events in the the room that we were using that were coming up later, so we did have to kind of move quickly through these interviews. Uh, but I do want to take a moment to direct everyone to uh, Chris Cottrell's Dabblers Den YouTube page, and if you want to learn more about the research that he's involved with. He's been putting out a lot of material here lately. Um, new videos have been coming out almost every week or two. So he's really uh, putting the pedal to the metal, putting a lot of time and effort. He's actually getting out in the field and, and working with other people and trying to get together all of, everything that he needs for his research. And he, he's doing quite a commendable job. So if you want to see more of what Chris Cottrell is doing, please stop by the Dabbler's Den webpage over on YouTube. And uh, you can see all of the videos that he currently has available. Yeah, and of course, it's not just the Carolina Bays that he focuses on. As the name entails, the Dabbler's Den looks at pretty much anything that Chris is interested in, but he's taken a real serious interest in the Carolina Bays. And although we have touched on that subject some in the past, one thing I think that's important to note, by the way, uh, George is as passionate about that subject and that aspect of all this as anyone. These are simply elliptical bay formations that are found throughout the southeast, not just in the Carolinas. There are different opinions about what their formation may have been. Some think that they are lake stream, which just means that they are uh, lake formations, that they were formed naturally as a result of lakes, possibly with some Aeolian, i.e. wind movement that caused the lakes to move back and forth, and you can see the ridge lines. Uh, others contend that these may be evidence of ancient impacts, and it seems very much that there are different opinions and different scientific approaches that are trying to prove one theory or the other. Uh, I've wondered if at times it may not be that there could be actually some validity to both of those perspectives. So that's definitely a subject that I want to dig into more in the future. And George, again, thank you for bringing it up. More importantly, uh, in addition to the ideas and everything, thank you for continuing to show your support and also uh, pledging support in the form of that $20 donation on a monthly basis. You guys can all do that. All you got to do is head over to 7ages.org. There's a donate button right there on the right-hand side of the page. You can pledge any amount one time or you can sign up for a subscription, and you don't need a PayPal account to be able to donate. You can use a credit or a debit card, and if you'd prefer to just mail us a check, you can do that too, and we have a mailing address there on the website, I believe. It's the post office box address. If not, we'll make sure that we make that available and plainly evident so that you can find that. But we appreciate the support in all forms. And that, of course, also just includes following us. You can follow our work on our YouTube channel, which James diligently moderates and keeps all of our videos and uh, other imagery up there. We've got a new video coming up uh, in the next few weeks. And, of course, I think our topper video that we already have on there has topped out over 20,000 views. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. It's over 20,000. Yeah. It's really been making some waves. So we're on YouTube. We're on Instagram. You can find us on Twitter. Find us on our Facebook page. Be sure and like and share the good word about what Seven Ages is up to, what we do, and how we try to educate the public as we learn, too. This is all part of a learning process. We are certainly educating ourselves and having the time of our lives doing it. And we're glad to have you guys along for the ride. Now, that said, we had a great connection made when we were down there at the swag site this spring and dr shane miller our good friend from mississippi state university who did a excellent interview with a live studio audience with us 
uh, we were talking with him, hanging out on the side. One of the most delightful people, one of the smartest guys I've ever met. Uh, but in that conversation with him, uh, our fascination with the enigmatic pre-Clovis site on the Oscilla River known as Page Ladson came up in the conversation. And Dr. Shane says, oh, Jesse Halligan, you know, who actually found the biface there. I know her. I bet I could get her on your show. Well, lo and behold, Dr. Shane pulled through. So thank you again, Dr. Shane Miller, our good friend and associate, for lining up the interview that you're about to hear, because I've wanted to talk with Jesse Halligan for a long time. Jason, would you like to give us a little background about her, uh, what role she plays in all this, and what we're about to get into with her? Yeah, well, she's basically heading up the excavations at the Paige Ladson site, uh, which is something that we've had a connection to in one way or another for the last couple of years, having had the opportunity last year to uh, speak with Mr. John Ladson, uh, who is the property owner there at the site uh, adjacent to the river. And, uh, you know, he really began this journey for us, filling us in on how important the site was, the history of the site, and shared a lot of uh, valuable information that really piqued our interest, which then led to our uh, finding out about Jesse and her work. And, you know, not only is she a uh, prominent archaeologist, but she's also in the unique position to be an underwater archaeologist, which we'll get into in this interview because it's a very unique and uh, certainly interesting type of uh, scientific research that we really hadn't heard that much about previously. So uh, she was able to really fill us in on a lot of details concerning that. And uh, I think you're gonna, all going to enjoy and appreciate the uh, Paige Latson story because it's one that is very unique. Yeah, in fact, in the ongoing debate about pre-Clovis, uh, Shane Miller and many others have talked about this, that they say, you know, there are still some questions about some of the pre-Clovis sites. He says, in my opinion, what they found at Paige Ladson is irrefutable. And although in our recent conversation with Dr. Charlie Ewan, we touched on underwater archaeology, uh, Charlie is a historical archaeologist. And so I think that our conversation forthcoming with Jesse Halligan may be the first time we have spoken at length with a professional underwater archaeologist. I'm so excited to be having this conversation about the Page Ladson site with Jesse Halligan right here when we return on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Jesse Halligan, Ph.D., is an assistant professor with the Department of Anthropology at Florida State University. She attended Texas A&M to look for sites that had been submerged by the rapid sea level rise that occurred at the end of the Pleistocene. And as she has written in the past, I well knew that most of the evidence of their lives on the now submerged landscape had probably been erased by the submergence process. Uh, but work done in Florida by a number of intrepid pioneers of underwater archaeology like Mike Fault, Andy Hemmings, and Jim Dunbar demonstrated that there were preserved sites offshore and in river channels of the Big Bend. The relative integrity of the sites wasn't well understood, and so for my dissertation, I undertook geoarchaeological investigation of two underwater sinkhole sites and the terrestrial landscape between them. Well, since that time, I think it's fair to say that Jesse's studies of prehistory have helped rewrite history in many ways, uh, with what many hold to be some of the most well-established archaeological evidence for a pre-Clovis presence in the Americas. So we are very excited to welcome to the program, Jesse Halligan. How are you? Great. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you so much for being our guest. Thank you. Well, you know, to begin the conversation, there's a lot to consider here when we're talking about pre-Clovis history. And specifically, uh, before we even get into that discussion, uh, one thing that always seems to come to to the forefront of the conversation is how did the people get to North America to start with? So currently there's three main routes in the discussions on the peopling of America. So we obviously have the Beringian, Beringian migration through the Ice Re Corridor. Um, another, uh, another hypothesis, if you will, that's gaining a lot of traction is uh, the use of a coastal route with watercraft along the West Coast. And then, of course, the very controversial uh, Salutrian hypothesis with people coming across the ice sheet from Europe into North America. Now, what's unique about Florida is it's not near any of those centers of, of uh, migration. So let's begin the conversation there. So what are your thoughts on how the first inhabitants arrived in Florida 
And what are the connections, if any, that can be related back to these migratory paths? So that's a really great question. And obviously, Florida is really far from anywhere people would come into the Americas. But it's really important to the story because Florida has the kind of site preservation that we wish we had everywhere in North America. Um, everywhere along the Beringian routes or along the North Atlantic routes is now been scoured by glaciers, drowned by sea level rise, scoured by major river floods, like the geological processes that have happened there have erased a lot of the signature. And if you're talking about the Northwest Coast, especially, there's a lot of isostatic rebound to deal with as well. So places that were 40 meters higher at the end of the last glacial maximum are now 100 feet under water or places that were 10 feet underwater are now 70 feet up in the sky. So um, Florida is less complicated geologically, and that's why it's good to have all those questions. Um, however, I think that Florida does not directly address any one of those three routes. Technically, the data from Florida could be applied to any of them. Um, the data that I have from Paige Ladson is a non-diagnostic stone tool and no DNA evidence of any human groups, so we can't say which humans left it behind. Um, I think that the broader data from North America more generally and from the old world more generally more strongly supports that people came from Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia to come into the new world. And therefore, I think it's much more likely that either the ice-free corridor route or the coastal route is more correct. I think a lot of recent geological research has shown that um, the ice-free corridor route is less tenable than the coastal route is, but there's not direct evidence for people walking down either one or taking a boat down either one of those right now. Um, and this is where Shane Miller and I agree to disagree because he is quite sure that the interior route is still very tenable. Um, I think that there would have been a lot of miles of glacial lake and uh, I don't think very many women would say, yes, let's pack my babies up and walk through that without knowing there's something on the other side. It'd be like, you know, we can go along the coast. There's rivers. I can see the salmon. There's delicious seals. It's a greater environment for it. But you want me to skip across ice flows in a glacial lake with no preservation, with no animals? Uh-uh. You can do that on your own. <laughs> Right. Well, you know, that's been the great challenge of archaeology is how do we make a good, strong case that there was another method of entry than by land? And, of course, what we would have to infer would be that it was some kind of watercraft, but this would most likely involve the use of perishable technologies, and hence they haven't lasted the test of time like that stone knife you found down there at the right. bottom of the Alcilla River. Now, I'm sure we're going to be talking a lot more about that over the course of the evening, but since you've already mentioned it, this is preeminently the evidence that you have retrieved from the site. Let's talk a little bit about that famous artifact um, and, and what it means for the site that you've been working now for so many years. Okay, so Paige Ladson is this really interesting archaeological site that it was originally discovered um, by a man by the name of Buddy Page. He was a Vietnam vet who had been a really intrepid guy who'd done a lot of really tough things at war, and he was probably suffering from what was PTSD, but nobody called it that at the time. And basically, one of the ways he dealt with returning to the States was he spent a lot of time diving in really dark portions of the Osceola River by himself in the 70s and 80s. Um, and in the early 80s, Jim Dunbar and David Webb, so Jim Dunbar's an uh, archaeologist who works here in Florida and has for about 45 or 50 years now, and David Webb, who was a geologist, a paleontologist at the University of Florida, um, had slowly come to find out about really interesting things that had been being found in the Osceola River by a number of river divers, none of whom were archaeologists specifically, but many of whom had training in geology or they were just really interested and really tough people. Um, 
anyway, they'd been doing some various dives in the Osceola, trying to find areas, and Buddy Page approached them, and I think about 80 or 81, though don't quote me on exactly the date, and said, hey, we have this really, I have this really cool area where I found a bunch of elephant bones. You guys want to come look at it? So they did, and they found this area where there was just this really huge extensive deposit of artifacts and mammoth bones and horse bones and mastodon bones and camel bones and all kinds of other giant extinct animals and stone tools and more recent things too like pottery and things like that and on one side of the site there was this area where there was a lot of layers of intact geological sediment so they started digging there they dug sporadically throughout the 80s and throughout the 90s and one of the years they found um, a mastodon tusk with cut marks on it in a place that would have been inside the mastodon's mouth while the mastodon was alive. Um, They said this was unambiguous evidence for people and they radiocarbon dated some of the um, sediment that was inside the cup of the cusk or of the tusk, right? Um, And that was... What we came to find out is mastodon digesta, a.k.a. mastodon dung, right? Mastodons hang out around water holes. They poo a lot, just like modern elephants do. They leave these enormous deposits around the sinkhole. And the sinkhole stayed wet long enough that all of that preserved enough to be buried by several meters, three to four to five meters, depending on where you are in the sinkhole of later sediments. Um, So they also found a few pieces of stone that they reported as being stone tools. When they got back the radiocarbon dates, they were in the 14,200 calendar years BP range. And everybody is just like, yeah, whatever. It's this weird site in Florida. Nobody thought it really meant anything. Cut marks on bones are not considered by many researchers to be strong enough evidence to say, oh, yeah, this is definitely a site, especially when it's an underwater site that people in general can't come visit, right? Um, So basically... A lot of people said, oh, that's cool, that's interesting, but nobody ever talked about Paige Ladson very much in their literature or anything. Or if they did, it's like, we don't really know what's going on with Paige Ladson. It might be an older site, we don't know. Part of the problem was is that the stone tools they reported were made of kind of a dolomite sort of limestone sort of thing that could maybe be considered chert, maybe, but not a really nice tool stone, and worse... It's the stone that the sinkhole that Paige Ladson is in is surrounded by. So a lot of people said, what happens if a fat little elephant sliding down into a sinkhole that has water at the bottom of it and it's, and he causes a rock slide and those rocks bang against each other and they break off some sharp rocks. Therefore, it's essentially um, an eco fact created by elephant feet, right? right? Again, ambiguous site. Um They finished their last excavations in 98, 99, somewhere around there. They wrote a book that was uh, published in 2006, um, a couple years after I started grad school. And really, like I said, nobody was convinced, convinced, or some people were convinced, but not everyone, right? It was kind of an ambiguous site. So I finished my dissertation research in 2012 on some other sites that were unambiguously sites um, that were a few miles away, one of which had an extensive Clovis deposit and one of which was a known site, but we didn't know how old it was. So um, basically, we had over that time been talking to the landowner, uh, John Ladson, who agreed to let us go back and try to resolve some of those ambiguities. So we opened up a big area and excavated in 2012. And then in 2013, we found that stone by face that you mentioned. It's uh, made of a church that is local to the area. It's um, the Swanee outcrop or Swanee limestone church that forms in the Swanee limestone, but it's not found in the actual site and it's unambiguously a tool it's got multiple flake scars on both sides it is how not however diagnostic of any particular culture it's just a bifacial stone knife that could be found um anywhere from 
the Paleolithic anywhere in the world, right? Like it's not it's not as super exciting. Oh yeah, this belongs to Salutrian people or this belongs to Northeast Asian people. So, and we also found a handful of other definite flakes in 2013 and 2014. Just a few other things that are definitely made by people down there in what is known as stratum three, geological unit three, um, that is made up of elephant dung and sand, essentially. So we were able to get a whole bunch of radiocarbon dates on it. We're now up to about 130 radiocarbon dates on the profile as a whole from the site. Um, And about 40 or so of them are from unit three. And they all date to pretty unambiguously at least 14,400 and some of the and some of the individual fragments are in the 14,900 15,000 years old so it's it's definitely a greater than 14,000 year old geological deposit and we found that stone knife laying within it so that's the most the compelling evidence that we have and that was actually found on top of Correct me if I'm wrong. Some of the actual mastodon feces that was left at that site, correct? It was right. Well, so that whole layer, geological layer three, it's about a meter to a meter and a half thick, and it's about fifty percent mastodon dung and about fifty percent sand. So yes, every single piece of the sediment down there is just about is mastodon dung. And it's very interesting because it is really well preserved. We have grape skins. We have um, grape seeds. We have little coils of grape vines. There's a uh, um, cucurbit of pipo seeds. So they were eating a lot of gourds. There were a lot, a lot of little twigs from cypress things. So we can identify individual plants and identify individual elements, identify things to species sometimes. And it does. It is this like wealth of radiocarbon datable material. Every individual piece of that you can submit for dating. Had there been a change in attitudes among the greater archaeological community when the early studies were being done? Because as I understand, I mean, it had been more than 10 years when you and Michael Waters and others revisit the site in 2012. Um, When you guys start finding evidence of ambiguous stone tools, had people kind of said, those radiocarbon dates, that can't really be right? Or or was was there, I guess... Was there any kind of resistance, in other words, to what the dates were indicating prior to the discovery of that cutting knife in situ that unambiguously oh. says? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's still some resistance. Like, there are still a number of researchers that say that our site can't be right, right? That we can't possibly um, be basically what we are finding doesn't fit the models that are accepted by a lot of researchers. Therefore it can't be right. There has to be something wrong with the dates. There has to be something wrong with the stratigraphy. Or I've heard a couple of people say, Oh, it's just the remnants of a migration of folks that just came through, died off real quick and didn't have anything to do with anybody that comes later. What? (laughs) Now that's funny though, because it sounds to me like if that's the argument they want to make against a presence in Florida at that period, Again, that doesn't remove the fact that the people were there. Somebody had to have left that artifact there. Do you still get that kind of resistance? Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, It's uh, absolutely the case, right? And to a certain extent, like, I'm really glad about it because... If I'm wrong, I mean, being being right is not my goal in life. Getting the story right is, right? And yeah. so if there's any way that there's something I haven't done, if there is a way that we could be messed up about the dates, if there is a way about any of that, you know, I'm happy to hear all those things. So far, everything that we've tested has come out that it really does seem like it's greater than 14,000 years old and that it does seem to be an intact stratigraphy. I have all kinds of cores like sediment cores through the soils that show that all kinds of stuff so so far i haven't been able to figure out a way that i'm wrong but i'm always looking and therefore i'm glad to have people come up with ways that i might be wrong so you can say yeah we tried that or hey yeah we'll get we'll send you any samples you want like let's figure this out yeah that's a good attitude to have well, let's you know talk about that area then. So, if people are you know calling you out and and still arguing over whether or not this is correct, what about the fact that there's what like 35 other sites in that general Alcilla River area that's you know from the Paleo period? So, do you have anything else 
supporting that pre-Clovis possibility with those other 35 sites or are all those considered uh, during Clovis or later? So that's a really interesting question. Um, there is a site that is downriver from Paige Ladson that I have never actually worked at that um, has supposedly dates and well, it definitely dates in the greater than 20,000 years old. And supposedly there was a flake found there as well. Um, I was not involved in that research at all. And it was done a long time ago. And um, I've never seen the flake or any of those things. But otherwise, all the, all the sites that the 35 sites that we know about, they are Clovis aged and younger. That is not to say that there aren't other places with um, older than Clovis states and one of them sloth hole uh may actually have another elephant that is older than clovis there was a baby mastodon a young mastodon there when andy hemmings excavated it for his master's thesis that does date to around that um well, older than Clovis, maybe as old as 14,000, 14,100 years old. Clovis, remember, is like 13,300, 13,200 years old on the kind of older end. Um, and it, it's a young mastodon dead on the edge of a sinkhole. Maybe people had something to do with it. Maybe they didn't. When it was excavated, um, we weren't really thinking that way about them, and we were, were didn't really excavate that whole thing. Again, that was stuff that Andy Hemmings did back in the day, and so I'd be interested to ask him what he thinks about it now, I guess. Um, but there are probably other sites as well. Like You have to be looking for layers below Clovis and excavating them actively if you want to find anything in them. Yeah, absolutely. And as we know, a lot of people tend to want to stop at the Clovis level for some reason. Um, and oftentimes we find that if you keep going, there's things to be discovered as we tend to keep learning that over and over again. But there's a lot of people listening who may have heard of the Page Lads and site who may not actually be able to visualize exactly what we're talking about here. So let's just back up for a moment and describe the site as it looks today, and then we'll revisit what it possibly would have looked like during the Paleo period. But uh, how wide is the river? What's the diameter of the sinkhole itself? How deep does it go? Just kind of paint that picture for us. Okay, excellent. So um, if you guys have never been on uh, the coastal plain of Florida, um, it's not like the coastal plain anywhere else. It's on a limestone platform, which means that unlike, say, South Carolina or Georgia or something like that, where you've got lots and lots and lots of sand and silt and mud and really old clay on your riverbanks, what you have in the Oscilla is limestone buried by anywhere from zero centimeters to about um, one and a half meters of sand, silts, clays, and everything else, right? So the, lam the limestone is really, really shallow there. And limestone's made of calcium carbonate, which is... Um, therefore basic and all rainwater all groundwater all of that is slightly acidic so every rainfall and every day of the aquifers in florida are dissolving that limestone little by little by little by little and therefore the coastal plain of florida is kind of like swiss cheese it's just eaten up with holes um eaten up with holes deep underground eaten up with holes on the surface and nothing in the limestone is like perfectly flat. So that's just setting the scene as a broad thing. The Oscilla River is a perfect example of a river on this kind of terrain, which is known to geologists as karst, K-A-R-S-T. Um, and basically the way the Oscilla works, it's not a very long river. It starts in Southern Georgia and only flows like I don't even know, 150 kilometers or, or less or something like that into the Gulf of Mexico today. Um, and it starts and it runs as like a, I don't know, 50 mile wide swamp that sort of flows southward towards the coast. Mm -hmm. um, and once it drops onto the coastal plain, it flows in fits and spurts. So it has 
a half mile run of water flowing on the surface and then it drops into an underwater or an underground cavern and then it comes up again and runs for another quarter mile and then drops down again and then runs for 20 feet and then drops down again. So um, the river can't be traversed from its source to its end. You have to you would have to take a canoe and portage it over huge chunks of swamp to get from chunk to chunk to chunk of the river. Um, and that's what it looks like today. So the river in the Page Ladson area, um, when the when it's dry, which it is right now, it hasn't rained for about a month and a half, the river's maybe 60 feet wide. Um, when it rains like it did all fall because of the hurricane season that we had, the river came out of its banks and because the coastal plain is so fat, uh, so flat, it was about 45 miles wide. It was about, it was a, like three inches of flood across the entire landscape. Right. And just open up and cover this whole area um, in. Page, so Paige Ladson is kind of in the lower third of the half mile rise section of the Osceola. It's about a half mile long, which is why it was so originally named um, where the river comes up, runs along the surface, as I said, about 70, 80 feet wide and then goes down um, into this big underground cavern to come up a few hundred meters downriver or actually maybe like a hundred meters um, down, down farther south. Um, the sinkhole itself is about 35 feet deep and it's about more like maybe 80 feet wide and it's probably 80 feet like it's probably about an 80 by 80 bowl right i'm used mm -hmm. i'm not used to thinking in feet let me think of but anyway <laughs> it's about that probably maybe 100 by 100 something like that and it's about 30 feet deep um on one side of the river uh, just upstream of it, the Wasissa, which is the only tributary of the Osceola, comes and meets it. And it's a tidally influenced area today because it's only about eight kilometers from the ocean. And so over the course of the day, there are rapids from where the Wasissa comes into the Osceola. And those rapids go away as tide comes in and then they come back as tide goes down and so on and so forth. And the water while you're diving is colder when it's spring fed by the Wasissa and warmer when the Gulf waters have come in and pushed it back and so on and so forth. Um, and if it hasn't rained for a while, the visibility underwater can be very, very good. We can see up to 10 or 15 feet um, right now. The visibility is amazing because of that. Last year when we were working, um, it had rained for about two weeks straight before we started our field season. And the Osceola is a tannic river. It's, uh, it drains the huge area of cypress swamp around it. So when it's been raining a lot, the cypress swamp, stains the river just like iced tea. It's basically like a giant thing of sun tea, right? Like the water runs off the leaves, ends up filling the river. And the visibility was about one foot. Um, and we had to get stronger and stronger lights to be able to see what we were doing. However, unlike Georgian rivers and South Carolinian, Carolinian rivers, there's no sand in the river. Mm -hmm. So even when it's flooding and running like crazy, it's just staying dark. If you have a light, you can see perfectly, even at 35 feet down in the dark black water. Yeah. Jesse, this all reminds me of something that you said once. You have, in fact, likened that underwater archaeology process in an often dark environment where lights are needed to being, quote, not unlike the experience of an astronaut. I mean, I, I would imagine it is kind of an alien environment being down there. Uh, add to that the fact that you're traveling back in time, but what's, what are some of the hurdles that you encounter with trying to maintain the precision of the archaeological process while you are 12 feet underwater? Actually, more like um, 25 feet for oh. Paige Latson, right? But, um, you know... In some ways, it's actually easier because you can be like an astronaut, neutrally buoyant. You can almost get rid of gravity. So, you know, when your knees hurt from kneeling on the side of a one by one and things like that, that doesn't happen when you dig underwater. You just kind of move and you can actually float upside down and dig if you want to. Um, the challenges are more along the lines of, well, you can't talk to each other because it's underwater. So you get to where you work, use really useful shorthand and you write notes to each other. Um, 
And you're, there's actually, honestly, there's a lot of advantages. Like, A, you can't talk while you're underwater, so you can just dig. I can and see that being very helpful. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah you can, you just, just, you're not distracted. But also, um, we use, uh, instead of filling buckets with your dirt and dragging them to a screen and screening them later, um, we remove the spoil with a uh, four inch induction dredge. Basically it creates a suction vacuum. There's a pump sitting on the surface um, and it creates this little, it has a little Y connector to this metal tube and that Y connector like gets water pumped into it at force, which creates a suction vacuum to a hose that goes down to the bottom of the river um, with us. And you guys, I've posted pictures of that and I can send you one too of what it looks like so people can visualize it if you want. But sure. basically it's down there at the bottom and the, and it's just constantly sucking. So your dirt's just going away. Like you trowel, dirt goes away. It goes up to the surface where people are sitting on a screen and looking at it and seeing what's up there. Um, the challenges are more in the extent that Every dive team has two people on it for safety and you have a dredge and you have people manning the dredge and then you have people on a boat digging. So unlike uh, excavation at a paleo Indian site on land where you might have eight excavation units open and eight teams working on those eight units, you never have more than two teams working at a time. So it's a lot slower in that sense. Like you can, you just don't have as many people doing stuff most of the time. People are usually only digging for one to three hours at a time. And then they come up and another team goes in and switches out. So you spend a lot less of your time being able to walk around and see what everybody's doing too. So it's just slower and how much excavation you get done per field season. That's maybe the biggest challenge. It's actually not that challenging to dig square holes or to keep control of our elevations we um, instead of using a string and a line level we have a laser that's designed a green light laser that's designed to work underwater and we put a line level on that so we can tell it's level and we swing it around in our sight and shoot it at our stick tapes to see how deep we are just like you'd use a line level on a terrestrial site so instead of basically the laser acts like a string essentially to tell you how deep you are yeah, the whole process is just so neat. Um, that mastodon tusk that you guys mm -hmm. retrieved with the cut marks, again, you'd mentioned that earlier and said that, you know, again, the problem is is that those cut marks, although they appear to be something that a human would have had to have made because that portion of the tusk would have been covered when the animal was extant. Now, the, the issue is, of course, that that is still not an actual tool. I even seem to recall people saying that there was some kind of like freshwater snail that could have caused those cuts or something ridiculous like that at some point. Quite obviously, that is sign of cut, bar cut marks in human predation, right? Well, so I consider cut marks also to be kind of a dark art. Like they're one of those things that you would expect to be much less ambiguous now. You'd think everybody would figure out exactly what makes a good cut mark and exactly what doesn't. But there's more debate about that than you would expect. Um, but we had folks who are experts in cut marks come back and look at the tusk. And I should clarify, the previous researchers found the tusk. I've only seen the remains of it in the Florida Museum of Natural History. It was excavated a long time ago. It was conserved and sampled and stuff like that. But there are still portions of it that you can see, especially the part where the tusk, where the cut marks are. And they took casts and molds of it right after they took it out. So those are pretty well preserved as well. Um, I would never trust my opinion on whether cut marks are real or not, but I trust other people's. And a lot of them have said that they think um, human agency is the most, I guess, the simplest exclamation for those cut marks, anything else, or, any, or those marks, anything else would require more strangeness than human cut marks, especially because it's in the same level now that we for sure have a human made tool. Therefore, you're in the same stratum and it's the same date. Why wouldn't you assume that they're related to each other? It's, you know, that's that's Occam's razor in that case. Yeah. You know, along those same lines of, of talking about the tusk and uh, you just gave us a fantastic description of what it looks like today. Let's back up for just a moment because Paige Latson is is remarkable in the fact that it provides that pre-Clovis timeline. But if we go back to the time period in which it seems to be dated to, uh, what is the site itself? Is it 
during that time period? Is it special at that time period or is it just another day in the life of a paleo person? That's a really good question. So as I said to you guys, um, Paige Ladson today is in the bottom of a river that's flowing constantly and it's about eight kilometers from the Gulf of Mexico. Um, at the time, 14,500 years ago, when that stone knife was left on in the site, it would have been none of those things. It would have been um, based on diatom evidence and pollen evidence and dung fungus evidence, as well as like what the sediments themselves look like. It would have been a small pond, probably spring fed, probably 20, 30, 40 feet wide, two, three, four feet deep, not, not a big pond. It would have just been a little water hole. And the general kind of pollen evidence shows that the broader landscape would have been fairly dry, and this would have been sort of like a little oasis on something that's probably akin to a savanna, right? Like a big, pretty open grassland. Um, interestingly enough, we don't know whether that would have been a grassland that was caused because there were large elephants on the landscape, proboscideans, because modern elephants today in Africa turn forest into grassland at the rate of multiple acres a year. So it might have been that rainfalls were pretty low and it was pretty dry and that's why it was a grassland, or it may have been kind of pretty warm and moist, but it was a grassland because there were mammoths and mastodons on the landscape that created this open savannah right we just don't we don't know enough about it one way or the other at that at that level but it would have just been this little pond and this little pond would have been over a hundred kilometers from the ocean at that time maybe well over a hundred kilometers from the ocean at that time so it was just like this tiny little inland pond with nothing exciting about it it's not at the edge of a giant cliff it's not at the confluence of two really big rivers it's not like you know where the Savannah River hits the ocean. It's not anything that would have been super notable. So people coming there either were really, like this was a local area and they didn't move very far in a kind of tethered life, or they moved a lot and they were following the mastodons from place to place to place as the mastodons moved from place to place or water hole from to water hole to water hole. But they probably knew this landscape pretty well because they had stone from kind of nearby. We don't know exactly where you can't really source chert very accurately to within a tiny outcrop or anything like that yet. Um, but in the broader, you know, hundred kilometer surrounding area, Everything that we have found at that site came from that and probably within the surrounding five kilometer area, really. Um, so the evidence that we have is a butchered mastodon, a stone tool, uh, like a stone knife and a few flakes. That is something you could accept for the organic preservation that allowed the mastodon tusk to survive. I have literally found that artifact assemblage in probably 200 shovel test pits in my life, right? Like in not even a significant find, right? Five face fragment, five or six flakes, great. Yay. What does that mean? Right. The only thing that's important about Paige Ladson is that it is in that stratigraphy that lets us date it so well. Yeah. You know, one of the things, though, that's really kind of preeminently important about this site is uh, that there were the pollen spores, the sporomalia that were actually recovered from the animal dung at that site. Uh, Floyd Largent, writing for the Mammoth Tusk back in uh, 2017, he had said the work of another CSFA team member, Angelina Parati, focused mm -hmm. on microscopic spores associated with such dung, and by pinning down the spore abundance of the fungus sporomalia, uh, which colonizes the dung of herbivores, Parati has poked a hole, he said, in the old overkill theory. He said further that her work, and this is, I think, significant, confirms that large herbivores lingered for thousands of years after humans arrived in Florida. So not only are we pushing the timescales back on human occupation in that region, but seemingly this is also raising questions and conjectures about the overkill hypothesis. Can you comment on that as well? Oh, absolutely. So basically what that was saying is, um, unsurprisingly, in a geological stratum that's approximately 50% dung, there are dung fungus in that stratum, right? So in strat unit three, um, there's a really high abundance of this spore armiella, this dung fungus that lives on the uh, dung of large herbivores. And the 
basically, though, it's interesting because it needs to be subaerially exposed at least a little bit for that dung fungus to grow. And then it gets buried and washed into the pond or whatever. And we end up with a lot of it. However, with our radiocarbon dated column, all of that dung fungus falls out of the column completely at about 12,600 years ago. So we have it at 15,000, 14,500, 13,000, 13,900, 13,800, 12,900. But at 12,600 12, calendar years ago, there's none of it, which is right about the time of the Younger Dryas when everything's changing. And that's when we thought, okay, people are um, maybe responding to the Younger Dryas, but all of the big animals are also dead at the beginning of the Younger Dryas. So if we have artifacts that date to 14,500, and we definitely have elephants up until 12,000, you know, 600. That's a good 2,000 years of people and elephants on the landscape together. And there are still people and there are still elephants. So we might have been the last kind of straw that broke the camel's back, but we weren't basically blitzkrieging through and killing all of them right away. It took a long time, if that's what happened. Well, I don't think anybody would dispute the idea that humans played a role. Humans play a role in terms of impacting our environment and species that are uh, you know, alive today. But I think that you know, we were talking with Dr. Chris Moore uh, back in March and uh, at a bonfire, and I, I actually said to him, I said, you know, if we're talking about humans, you know, hunting animals to extinction, look at all of the different kinds of animals that have been around for thousands of years longer than the period that humans coexisted on the North American continent with these megafaunal, megafaunal varieties. And I said, what about white-tailed deer? What about all these other kinds of animals? You know, why aren't they extinct? And Chris said, well, good question. Now, there is always the point that some of them may breed differently and are capable of breeding and dispersing in their population uh, over larger areas of land, and they can thrive better than a large uh, mammoth, a creature that's going to have a harder time presumably escaping from a large group of people that might go after it. Sure, but again, the idea seems to be that the evidence is mounting that there were probably more things in the environment that were contributing to those extinctions than just people and their involvement. And I guess the problem I have with it, Jesse, is that I think people get married to pet theories and, <laughs> you know, and, and they want to kind of not only say that, well, this is what happened, but also this relates to some of the environmental problems that we're seeing in the world today. And therefore, we feel better making that argument, you know, and, and I think that we have to kind of slow our roll a little and say, hey, maybe there is more to this and we are learning things that conflict with our general ideas. Right. Oh, I think that's true. Um, I think the answer is almost always more complicated than a single than a single cause for anything ever, right? Like, that's not the way it works unless you're eight years old, right? Um, <laughs> oh, those days. Is very <laughs> yes, exactly. The world's a very complicated place. Um, I do think, though, I saw some a paper a while back, and I'm trying to remember where I say it because I it, like, it had a big influence on me. One thing that I thought was really, really interesting is modern African elephants – do this thing where they live in matrilineal herds and they kick out the boys when they're teenagers and they live in little teenager boy herds for a while and they sometimes get their own herds. A lot of them die. A lot of other things happen to them. And almost all of the elephants that we have evidence of being killed in um, Paleo-Indian contexts are young males. So perhaps people are causing the slow extinction of elephants by killing those bachelor males and therefore they're not being high quality males to take their place as they're dying out and therefore weakening the genome over time. So again, not the primary cause, but a kind of down the line chain cause that could be things. And I really wish I could remember that brilliant article that was written because it's totally not my idea and I don't want to take credit for it, but I do think it's really compelling and interesting. Well, I'm sure we can find it, but that is incredibly interesting. Thank you for raising that point. Yeah, and of, of course we have, you know, the 35 genera that were uh, going extinct around that same younger dry as uh, time period. So there's, like you said, Jesse, there's a lot to it. And I'm sure it's not just one simple answer. There's a lot there to consider. Uh, right. Obviously, a lot of dynamic things happening in the world at that particular time. 
you know, talking a little bit more about maritime archaeology in general, Paige Ladson, I think, is is a fantastic example of that and something that we can really focus on. But Florida kind of is a hotbed because we know that the sea levels were so much lower during the Paleo time period. Um, there was so much more land that was available for people to settle on and, and move about through. So talking about maritime archaeology, are there currently any other underwater or offshore exca- excavations in or around Florida that uh, the listeners should be aware of? Oh, absolutely. Though I also think it's important to point out that in Florida, all Paleo-Indian archaeologists are diverse. We all work underwater because of the preservation <laughs> of that underwater site, right? That's not true anywhere else in the world. Um, nobody else, the late Pleistocene is populated by underwater people. Um, but <laughs> In Florida, we have some great sites. Uh, what Some of my colleagues at the Florida Bureau of Archaeological Research have been doing some offshore excavations near, um, well, on the Gulf Coast side of Florida, down near Minnesota Key, they found a cemetery that dates to the same age as the Windover site offshore. It preserved sea level rise, sea level transgression, and has only been recently exposed by recent storms and um, shark or shark tooth hunting activity. People dive off there a lot to look for shark's teeth, and they were pulling up human bones as well. And so there's been some really cool... Um, discoveries. This is the first site we found that unambiguously has survived intact sea level transgression, though it's pretty threatened now. Um, and those folks at the Bureau of Archaeological Research have been working with the Seminole Tribe and some other folks to try to salvage some of that information in case the next big hurricane takes it all. Yeah. yeah. The ever-present threat of us that live close to the coast. Right. Uh, the, the, yeah, those hurricanes are always creeping around this time oh, of the boy. year. Yeah, they are. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's there's something I, I kind of want to touch on before we, we wrap here. But uh, obviously, we, we've talked a little bit about underwater archaeology and how it's done, at least at the Page Latson site. But what are some of the other challenges with underwater archaeology? I mean, and not just the physical side of it, but, you know, budgeting and interest and, you know, for archaeologists, are there a lot of archaeologists coming out of school that are interested in underwater archaeology? Do you have a harder time getting appropriations for budget to do these type of uh, underground or underwater excavations? So underwater archaeology is something that um, it's in, it's an interesting space. So sometimes we're kind of considered like the cowboys of science who don't really know how to do real archaeology and we're not really very precise. And in some cases, that was probably a well-deserved title back in the day. Um, and so some archaeologists don't respect us as being precise, real scientists who are asking anthropological questions and things like that, though I think a lot of that's been changing in the last few years. Uh, but the general public loves what we do. They think it's really exciting to think, oh, there's elephants underwater, like tell us all about that. So that can help. Like it does give us a higher profile, probably more than we deserve at certain times because people are excited about what we are finding. Um, and that can help with getting grant money or it can hinder depending on what's going on. However, underwater archaeology is a lot more expensive, 10 to 100 times as expensive as excavating the same amount of landscape under on terrestrial, a uh, same terrestrial landscape, right? Because everything that we find has to be conserved as well. Um, and that's one of the benefits of underwater archaeology. We find things preserved that don't preserve on land. Um, we have... Uh, pristine sites. We have sites with 14,000-year-old elephant dung. All of that's long since dried up and been eaten away. Um, But we have to conserve it. And that means we need a budget that goes on for years, sometimes decades after we've finished excavating. Um, And that can be harder to sell to lawmakers. You need a million dollars. You finished that excavation 10 years ago. Why do you need to still, why do you still need a million dollars for conserving the ship timbers of the bell or something like that? You know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of hard decisions that end up having to be made afterwards. Um, But I think, The reason it is hard, but it's hard because it's worth it, because we find such unique, exciting things. I don't dive because I like diving. I dive because it gives me a chance to answer questions I can't. Yeah. With regard to the preservation of archaeological sites that have an aqueous or a semi-aqueous content, um, if we go to to Chile and uh, the 
Pilauco site recently. It was in the news, not so much with regard to uh, Chris Moore and their um, their discovery of similar microspherule and other evidences that they contend may relate to the Younger Dryas, but there was the discovery of that ichnofossil remain of a human foot that dates back roughly to about the same time period as some of what you guys are removing, maybe older actually than what has been uncovered at the Page Ledson site. Um, you know, to find human um, presence and evidence of it archaeologically that far south, does that in any way, do you think, relate to the human presence in North America that you guys are observing all the way up here in North America, but generally contemporaneous at Page Ladson? So um, not even that, but, you know, sites like Monteverde and other such sites too. They, the coast of South America has had a lot of pretty old stuff for a long time. And as someone who has no trouble thinking that people may have come um, to the New World by a boat, I think it makes a lot of sense because you can move along a coastline really far, really quickly without having to change your life ways that much. If you're hopping from river mouth to river mouth to river mouth, they all have fish. They all have somewhat similar plants. You can adapt and move really quickly if you if you want to work that way, whereas like walking over giant mountain ranges and stuff is a lot harder and you have to learn a lot more different life ways um to me that doesn't i think i think the evidence from page ladson suggests there had to be a decent number of people on the landscape because of how unimportant page ladson probably was at the time how insignificant it was and how in the middle of nowhere not fancy place that it was and therefore the fact that a big chunk of the continent both north and south america may have been colonized by that time doesn't surprise me, right? Like, I think it has to be that it was fairly densely settled and fairly densely may mean not densely at all to anything we think of, but that there were probably some people pretty much kind of everywhere. Well, I don't want to be presumptuous, but again, if what we are finding is, again, that there is a preservation of ancient human sites, and even, again, in areas where there may not have been a great accumulation of people in terms of population at that time. But if we find more of that at sites where, again, the water has preserved uh, those circumstances, so much so that, again, down there at Pila Uca, we have a footprint. We, I, th- I think we also had one at Monte Verde, because I recall Jim Adavazio yeah. showing a photograph of one. So we have a lot of that in that part of the world. We have, again, what, and I'll quote our good friend Dr. Shane Miller, he says, Paige Ladson, as far as pre-Clovis, it's the one that I absolutely cannot in any way make an argument against. He he says it's really, I think, the best site, in my opinion, and I would have to agree. So maybe we need to look at more underwater archaeology in the furtherance of our knowledge about what was happening in the world at that time. Well, I would, I mean, obviously I'm a bit partisan on that. Of course, I think that's what we need to do. But I think we need to look anywhere that the preservation is, right? Like Kurt Rademacher has been doing some really exciting work in the high altitudes down in the Andes and has been finding lots of sites and they're way older than we think because nobody had looked for them before. But now that we're looking, we're finding that people are there. So I think we need to look for the places that will have the preservation that will allow us to ask and answer the questions we care about. We can dig as many um, sites with no organic preservation as we want, and we'll find some really cool stone tools, but we're not going to be able to answer a lot of big questions about when at sites that don't have preservation that will let you answer when. We certainly want to thank Jesse for her time. She was a great guest. We really enjoyed speaking with her. Um, I'm hoping that the future is going to bring more evidence from the Page Lads and Sight. Uh, so we want to thank her for sharing that time and information with us. Speaking of sharing, there is a brand new podcast, uh, archaeology based, called A Life in Ruins Podcast. It has three hosts, just like we do Carlton, Connor, and Seven Ages alumni, David Ian Howe, who appeared on episode 17 of the Seven Ages audio journal called of wolf and man where we talked about the fascinating field of ethno synology 
So these guys have come together and as friends and built a new podcast and they're certainly trying to get the word out. So, you know, stop by, give them a listen. And if you like what you hear, subscribe. Same thing with Seven Ages. Please subscribe, rate and review. That's what keeps podcasts alive and relevant. And that's how more people are able to find them. So again, that is a Life in Ruins podcast. Uh, Stop by and check them out. Absolutely. Always glad to support our fellow podcasters, especially in the anthropological field. And before we wrap things up completely, uh, we did have, as Jason mentioned earlier in the program, an opportunity to talk with John Ladson, whose name, of course, some of you may recognize because the Page Ladson site is partially named after him. And uh, he gave a wonderful lecture about the history of archaeological research at that location, uh, which we were able to attend. And uh, afterward, he was kind enough to do a interview with us very briefly and answer some questions. And we'll feature some audio from that interview with John Ladson now. All right, John, what is your family connection to the Page Ladson site? Well, the Page Ladson site sits in what's called the Half Mile Rise section of the Elsula River. And uh, my family owns approximately 2,300 acres of land uh, that, uh, that joins and, uh, the uh, Half Mile Rise, in fact, controls most of the frontage along the Half Mile Rise. So our connection is that we are the adjoining landowner. Uh, can you tell us how the site was originally found? Yes, the site was originally found by some avocational divers, in particular a man named Buddy Page, who uh, did quite a bit of diving in the Alcilla and uh, was, uh, was an ex-Navy SEAL and uh, brought the site to the attention of Dr. David Webb, in particular at the University of Florida. Uh, Can you describe to us a little bit about the staging for the dives and excavations once the site had been discovered that it was of archaeological significance? How did they set up for the excavation? Well, uh, it it was a pretty monumental process because there was no real good access into the site other than uh, through our particular track. And our road system through there, although it's, uh, it's better than a trail, it is somewhat fragile. So, you know, any significant rainfall or bad wet weather uh, and you could be shut down but they had to move all kinds of equipment everything from vehicles boats you know screens coring rigs you name it they had to move it through that swamp over that road system into the site so after the long process of excavation what were some of the more significant artifacts that were found on the site well for page in page lads and the <laughs> I mean, they found lots of artifacts because they went down stratigraphically, layer by layer, you know, from the from the late uh, period all the way down to the very early period, the Paleo period. And in the process, they found lots of artifacts. Uh, The Bolin level, as they described it, was extremely um, plentiful. They found a lot of the Bolin level, and I think the Bolin level is late Paleo, early Archaic, you know, eight, nine thousand years old. Um, They actually found at the Bolin level, as I recall, wooden stakes still driven in the ground there. That's how good the preservation was. But, you know, the the artifact that that, uh, was the most exciting one was the tusk, the mastodon tusk they found uh, down at the paleo level. And uh, a friend of mine who was there said that when it came out of the water, it literally gleamed, gleamed. It was so bright and so well preserved. So uh, the preservation was remarkable on that tusk. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, it showed butcher marks at the base, which put man there, although they didn't quite find all they needed to get the scientific community to validate it at that point. And how did they get to the point of validating the tusk? And the, the, way they, the way they finally got validation of the tusk was um, the project, the field work in the original project stopped in 1997. And there, there it lay until January of 2012 when I was contacted by Dr. Michael Waters uh, out at Texas A&M. And he wanted to go back in that site. I, I never in my wildest imagination thought Texas A&M would be, you know, the, the entity that came back into the picture. But I didn't realize, too, that the Center for the Study of the First Americans had been moved to Texas A&M. Originally, I believe it was in Maine. And uh, it later went under the auspices of Texas A&M. So that's why he was interested in it. He wanted a site that he knew had good preservation. He had studied the site, felt like it just needed a little more work to get that smoking gun, as they say. And he sent Jesse Halligan, a young woman uh, uh, that worked with him in there to direct the project who was outstanding. 
And within two years, she had found a broken bifacial flint knife there, and that was dated unequivocally at 14,550 years, I believe. So that, uh, you know, that was absolutely the crowning achievement. What is the future for Paige Ladson? Are there any... Well, that's, that's interesting. You mentioned that about Paige Ladson. Uh, Dr. Waters, I spoke with Dr. Waters earlier, well, in the last year, in the fall of last year, and he asked me if they could go back in there again. Um, I have not heard from him since then, but I expect he's going to contact me and they're going to want to go back in and do some more work there. So who knows? Who knows what else is down there? Uh, it remains to be seen, but I think there will be further work at Page Labs. And there's been quite a bit of work done by Jesse Halligan, Dr. Halligan, uh, who found the bifacial knife up in the Wasissa River, which is just above the Alcilla. She's been working there quite a bit. Um, and doing some work in the lower Alcilla. So they're, they're working all around it, uh, and they are, are going to come back to it uh, probably this year. Okay, so being the, being the landowner and being, you know, an integral part of all this, just kind of give us an idea of what does it mean to you? What is a page like? Well, Why you know, I, I think, you know, what it, what it means to me is uh, several, uh, several levels. Um, one, as a, as a boy growing up, and I, I've been going down there all my life, I've always been fascinated with that place and the Alcilla River and heard tales of Indians and Indian mounds. And as a child, I just could imagine the Indians roaming through the swamps. And so I've, I've had a, a, you know, a great passion for it uh, all my life. And, it's, and, and, and I also had a great interest in archaeology. Uh, love to read about it and, and, and love history in general. And so to have that project more or less fall into my lap, my family's lap, was just just an incredible gift. I can't put it any other way. It was just an incredible gift. And it's been great to be associated with a lot of really wonderful people and to understand how the archaeological process works. So I think the contact with the people uh, and the friendships over the years have been very, very meaningful. And it's nice to be able to contribute to science in some way. I, I certainly am not qualified to contribute in any other way other than maybe, you know, as a landowner. So I think that probably is the best answer I can give you. And that is a wrap, ladies and gentlemen, John Ladson and Jesse Halligan. I think that this is probably one of the more comprehensive podcasts on this subject that uh, I certainly have heard. And of course, you heard it here first. We're always glad to be able to bring you guys out there, the listeners, uh, knowledge on the very forefront of not just North American archaeology, but really archaeology all around the world. We love Egyptology. We love studying North and South America. We love studying Eurasia. We love all aspects about the past, and we try to address them all here on this podcast, and as well as enjoy a little of James Waldo's homebrew. So, fellows, what do you say we pony on up over here and see how the old boy has done? Imbibe at your own peril. Yeah, I guess we're going to find out. Jason, let's hope that his version of the Seven Ages stout this go-around uh, doesn't end up tasting like the famous black drink that was imbibed here in the Americas long ago. What do you say? Well, let's drink it out of a conch shell and we'll find out. I guess we will. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks again for joining us here in the Crosstime Pub as we explore the nature of reality itself and questions about our past. Jason, James, and Micah Hanks, we are the Seven Ages Research Associates, and we will catch you again next time here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Journal.